Hi, folks. Steve Urban here. Today's episode of the Rutterflex podcast is sponsored by Marketing 360. My good friend J.B. Kellogg and his team do such a fantastic job for us and so many other companies. Marketing 360 is the number one platform for small business, and it's everything you need to grow your business. If you need marketing support, I really encourage you to contact them at marketing360.com slash writerflex, and we'll add that link to the description of this episode for easy reference. On today's episode of the Writerflex podcast, we have guest Clive Smith. He's the founder and CEO of Think Labs. The Think Labs One marks another paradigm shift in stethoscope design, a bold move to eliminate the hollow tube styling that predates the American Civil War. <laughs> uh, Clive Smith on the Rider Flex podcast. Clive, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. Are you, let's see, what part of Denver are you in? Yeah, we're in Southeast Denver, so we're down in Centennial, so uh, we're probably not too far from you. I'm uh, up near Loveland. I'm a little north, matter of fact. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but these days we're all, well, it seems like everybody's remote, doesn't it? <laughs> right, yeah. It doesn't really matter where anyone is on the planet anymore right now. We're all in, we're all in this together in the soup. Right. For the listeners, by the way, we're recording this on July 14th, 2020, so if you happen to be listening to this episode a few years from now, uh, that's what we're talking about is uh, a lot of people working from home due to COVID and all of that stuff. I have uh, gone out to a restaurant recently with my wife, which was like the first time we've been to a restaurant in, I don't know, th four months or whatever it's been. Really? Uh, and that was great just to be out, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you sit outdoors? <laughs> Uh, we didn't. No, we didn't sit outdoors, but they, they were doing the uh, every other seat deal, you know, trying to kind of space people. Um, yeah. I remember t I told my wife, I said, you know, I really don't even care if the food's bad, if the, if the service is bad. Like, I don't even care. I'm just glad to be out of the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, you know, we've got some favorite restaurants and, and for those people who are in the rest of the country or in other countries, you know, Denver has really developed some fantastic restaurant culture and right. we really want to, we hope that that survives because there's some just, there's just been such a fantastic growth here. That's mm -hmm. been just amazing. I mean, Denver's really has been a, a, a city with a lot of buzz for right. a number of years. And uh, yeah, we really hope that this doesn't, doesn't, okay. it's going to, there's going to be some damage, but we hope that we don't lose, lose all those gains that we made. I totally agree. I, <clears throat> my wife and I don't have a lot of vices, but going out to dinners and happy hours is one of them. And we've sure have missed it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. Tell the, tell the listeners a little about you personally, before we get into think labs, just your history and maybe some family stuff where you grew up, stuff like that. Yes. Yeah, so I grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa. And, um, so, which where I grew up was not that different from Denver, Colorado, actually. It's 6,000 feet altitude and suburbia. And, uh, you know, that's where I grew up. And I went to the univers University of the Witwatersrand, is how we say it, Witwatersrand, um, which is, a, you know, a local major university in, in Johannesburg. And I did electrical engineering there. Okay. And then I always wanted to do graduate study uh, overseas. I wanted to come to America. From from the, from a young age, I always looked to America. You know, I was, I'm one of these guys who was going to be an engineer when I was five years old. So, I, you know, I became an engineer. And, you know, some people say engineers are born, they aren't made. And if that's true, then I'm born that way. Gotcha. Um, and... So I always wanted to do engineering and growing up, I used to always look to the United States as being obviously the technological leader. Uh, the moon landing was a big deal to me as a kid. Okay. It, uh, it was a real inspiration. So, so when I, you know, I did electrical engineering, you know, I wanted to come and study and America was the logical place to come for technological and technology education and um, came to the States uh, and did a master's at Caltech. 
um, which was not related to the moon landing, even though they've got jet propulsion uh, laboratories there. I just, you know, Caltech is a really good university. Mm-hmm. And I did a master's in, um, in electrical engineering and signal processing and electronics. And then I moved out. I got an offer to move out to Denver, job offer, and spent a few years in uh, working in a large corporation. Mm. But I was always the personality that doesn't like to be in a box in a large corporation. And, um, and growing up, my father used to tell me every single evening. And when I say every single evening, I mean literally every <laughs> single evening at the dinner table, never work for a boss. Mm. he did not like working for a boss. And so, you know, we were just school that, you know, you've got to have, you've got to be your own boss. So I worked in a corporation for nearly five years and I got good experience. It's useful to learn how large companies work and what they do well and what they don't do well. Right. And then I started, I went out on, you know, started think labs and, well, and yeah. Let me ask you real quick. Was your dad an entrepreneur business owner? No, he was, he was a person who lived with regrets for not being an entrepreneur. And <laughs> that's, that's why, why I, that's why he said that every evening. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and one of his regrets when he was, when he was older was, I was really sorry that I didn't have my own business. And so, you know, there was a lesson. It was like, you know, don't, don't have regrets about it. Just get out and do it. Mm-hmm. And I've got so many friends who, talk about wanting to have their own businesses and they've been talking about it for many, many years, but you know, it's a difficult thing to do. And, you know, so I, you know, I know a number of people, my contemporaries who have always wanted to do it, but it's a, there's a big difference between wanting to do it and actually having the ice water in your veins that you need to Mm. actually go out there and be incredibly vulnerable. Right. Yep. It's scary for a lot of people, for sure. We'll get, I want to get into some of that uh, entrepreneurial stuff here uh, towards the back end. But let me ask you, so you're working for this other company. You, you, you knew you had the entrepreneurial bug for a while. You knew you wanted to do something on your own. How did you drift towards stethoscopes and think labs? Like how, how, why that area? Walk, walk me through some. I think you were a I know on the bio, you know, it says music buff, sound buff, you know, so those are maybe some of your passions, but walk me into kind of how you got there. So, so I always had an interest in medical electronics. <clears throat> when I was an undergraduate for my senior thesis, um, I did with, with, a, with a friend, thesis partner, we did a, a biomedical uh, thesis for our undergraduate work in electrocardiography. So I always had an interest in medically related electronics. Okay. And I was doing some research on a project that I was doing and I was in, a, in the medical school library looking something up and I stumbled across this article. It was a paper from the 1960s that I was looking in the stacks in the, you know, in the, in the medical school library And um, I stumbled across this research paper of someone who had built, um, they they were doing some acoustic testing of stethoscopes to see which ones were better and which ones were worse. These are just conventional stethoscopes. And what this researcher did was build a replica of the original stethoscope. And for those who don't know what the original stethoscope was, it was just a hollow wooden tube. It was literally a, a, a piece of wood with a hole in it that the, that Rene Lenec, the Frenchman, he put it up against his ear. He put it up against the chest of the patient and he would listen to their chest. And that was the first stethoscope. It was just a hollow tube. Wow. And, um, and what this research paper that I found discovered was that the acoustics of that replica of the hollow tube from 1816 sounded about the same as a modern stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> except that it was on one ear instead of two ears. And so I read that and I thought, okay, the single most commonly used medical device on the planet hasn't improved in nearly 200 years. This is insane. I didn't know that. And by the way, until I read that on the website and I was studying for you in this, this, this interview, I thought, wow, really? Oh, nobody's done anything with it since then. That was my first reaction. <laughs> right. So it's, it's crazy, isn't it? So, so anyway, I looked at that and I thought, well, I know electronics, I know signal processing. Um, 
you know, I've got the background to do, you know, an audio electronics. So I've got the background to do this. This should be really, really easy. Yeah. And so what I did was I literally started tinkering around in my garage and, um, and doing, you know, doing prototypes and experiments and listening and listening and listening. And I actually spent, it took me eight years to put a product on the market. Well, now, were you working at the time? You're still working? Yes. Oh, yeah. I was, I was, so I had Think Labs at the time and, and I was doing consulting and design work for other people. So what I was doing was I was consulting to, you know, to pay thing, you know, pay to the pay bills. the bills. Yep. And I was, uh, I was doing this design work, you know, on my off hours and my weekends and nights and all this kind of thing to perfect this design. Um, and as I say, I spent, you know, I spent about eight years doing it. I filed patents. Um, you know, it was a long, long road and, you know, perfectionism is a bit of a bug. It's a, well, it's a disease actually. So that kept me going for a long time and then eventually brought it out on the market and, and continued under the name of Think Labs. Well, let me ask you. So, so my, one of my questions early on is that when I saw the timeline and I was looking, I thought, okay, well, man, he worked on this for a long time. So yeah, my first question was, okay, how did he eat and pay the bills during this, this development phase? <laughs> so right. I appreciate you. I appreciate you clarifying that. So did, did some consulting work and different things to pay the bills. Okay. And then you're working on this stuff at night, weekends, any of your extra hours, you're doing this stuff. Was that tough at that age? How old were you then? And did you have a family too that you were trying to spend time with and you're trying to do like, How'd you, how'd you balance all that? Oh yeah, my kids were toddlers. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Hang on a second. Um, they were in elementary school, actually. Okay. So it was like from the time that they were in elementary school through kind of junior high age age range. You're out in the and, garage messing around with this stuff at night, and they're tugging on your shirt. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I'm in, you know, and I and I'm in my thirties at that time, and it was really, really you know, really challenging. It was challenging to get the design right. And you have no idea when you're doing this kind of thing, whether you're completely wasting your time. <laughs> right. It's not, so, you know, in hindsight, it looks relatively straightforward. Okay. So you work on something for a few years, you do consulting, you bring in the, you know, you, you put food on the table, everything's fine. You do this in your spare time. Sounds quite relaxing. It's quite fun actually. <laughs> <laughs> but but in real time, what's going on is that you actually have no idea whether right. you're going to get the performance you're going to get. Are you ever going to get this on the market? What is your path to the market? How are you going to get there? Mm -hmm. There are so many things that you have no idea that are going to succeed and any one of them is going to destroy you. <laughs> so you really, you're putting time into something and that's what people don't realize when they look at retrospective stories is that when you're in the moment, you actually have no idea whether this is a complete, unbelievable, colossal waste of time. <laughs> and there's people in your life at that point, probably, I'm guessing, somewhat challenging you, or maybe challenging is not the right word. There's got to be people in your life, whether it's your mom or dad or whoever. So, somebody's like, Clive, like, are you sure about this? Or I mean, there's got to be some of that going Absolutely. on, right? <laughs> totally, totally. Oh, everybody is second guessing you. <laughs> um, and everybody's got advice, right? I yeah, mean, yeah every, no. right, right. Everybody's got, everybody's got advice. Everybody yeah. So, advice. yeah. Oh yeah. You, you get, you know what, you get both. You get the people who are the cheerleaders and they're cheering you on and they're saying, this is amazing what you're working on. This is so creative and you know, you're really doing this and good for you. You're in your own business and all that kind of thing. So you get that part of it and then you get the other people who are really worried for you. Right. right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. All right. So I can, I'm visualizing all this, by the way, toddlers at home, elementary school, trying to do consulting, pay the bills, building this thing, not having any idea where it's going. And you just like, okay, I know I need to make this. The world needs this. I don't know how I'm going to get it to market, but I'm just going to keep going. Okay. Are you, you're bootstrapping it yourself at this point, just paying for, you're just buying all the parts and whatever yourself, probably. Total bootstrapping, and there, and there's a story to the bootstrapping as well, which we can get into later. You can okay. we can talk about that, but yeah, I'm bootstrapping at that point, um, and bootstrapping the entire family for that matter. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, right. It's so I'm doing that, and then um, what happens in um, none none of the major companies in the market had an electronic stethoscope at the time. Okay. 
And then towards the end, so it start, I started doing this in about, you know, 94, 95, maybe started in 92, 93, but got serious in 95, okay. kept going. And in about 2000, 2001, um, by that time, a couple, of, a couple of the major companies actually had electronic stethoscopes in the market. So there I'm looking and I'm saying, uh-oh, the majors now have stepped into this market that actually when I started, there was nobody there. I see. So now the market space is occupied by really well-recognized brand names. Do I give this up or don't I? And what I would do is that the day that these products would hit the market, mm -hmm. I would FedEx them in and I would listen to them and I would say, okay, what do I have? Do what I, is mine better than theirs? Mm -hmm. And every time it was like this huge sigh of relief. Okay, the major company developed something, they put it on the market, but it's not very good. Okay. okay. You've got something better. Keep that going. Was, yeah, that was fuel. That was fuel for you to keep going. Okay, so you're checking the competitors. You're FedExing this stuff in. You're like, okay, well, yeah, this, yeah, this is not as good as my stuff. Okay, gotcha. I know where you're at. Go, go yeah. for it. So, so what happened is one of the companies that actually put one on the market was Hewlett Packard Medical. At that time, HP was breaking itself apart into a company called Agilent Technologies and Hewlett Packard. Okay. And the medical division was going to this new company called Agilent. And they had this, they brought out this electronic stethoscope and, um, and Agilent eventually then uh, gets rid of their medical division and sells it to Philips Medical. So there's a whole lot of transition. Why is this relevant? Because through this whole transition, which is about 2001, 2002, 2003, roughly, um, I go to um, HP Agilent Philips. They changed oh. their name three, you know, a couple of times. And I say to them, I've got some prototype work that I'm doing, which sounds better than anything that you just put on the market. Sweet. I love that hustle right there. You're just pounding, knocking on doors, trying to get a meeting saying, look, right, I, yeah. I need to, oh, good. Right. And it's just you, just you. It's just me. Just love it. Okay. Yep. So, so I, they say, okay, we'll take the meeting. Come and show us what you got. Let's do a mutual non-disclosure agreement or, and I, show up there and I walk into this huge boardroom with, uh, you know, I don't know, six or seven people or whatever it was. I can't remember oh, how many. Is this your first big pitch in front of a bunch of like huge people? Is this your yes, first yeah, big? Yeah, it's the first time, yeah, it's the first time anybody's seen it other than a couple of doctors here in Denver. Okay, now uh, one more thing. Uh, is there anything patented or protected at that point yet? Or you just had the NDA to kind of protect you? That's it. I've got patents filed at that point. Okay, sorry. Just I wanted filed to kind of, patents, all right, yeah. okay. All right, so I filed all right. patents, I've got an NDA. And I go in there and I do a presentation that tells them absolutely nothing <laughs> um, about what it really is. And then they say, okay, well, that's very nice pitch. Let's listen to what you got. And they listen to it. And when I walk into the meeting, the, the head of the group says to me, I just want to warn you about something that Bill Hewlett used to ask why there weren't electronic stethoscopes of Hewlett and, you know, Hewlett Packard. Yeah. Yeah. He said, that's how old the idea is. He said, everyone who has ever developed an electronic stethoscope has come through these doors to pitch. Oh. Well, so I just want to, I don't want, I don't want to raise your hopes. <laughs> so that was the, that was the beginning of the meeting. So I said, okay, that's fine. Okay. So I do, I do this sort of, you know, minimal information pitch. And then they say, let's listen to it. And I, I'd let them listen to this prototype. And they say, okay, we've, you, you, you know, we've never heard anything like this. Oh, all right. Now you're, now you're all of a sudden you're feeling good right there, right there. You're like, Ooh, I'm like, okay. I right. Like they say, we've never heard anything like this. And they said, in fact, they said the, the only people we've heard um, that have done something like this came to us and they had $10 million worth of funding. And the thing was too expensive. It was using very complex technology and it was too expensive to manufacture. Um, you got to tell us more about what's underlying your technology and whether it's manufacturable or not and all this kind of thing. But they say to me, you said that you bootstrapped this. And I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I just work at home and I build this stuff. <laughs> so they said, okay, we need to send a, an engineer out. We've got, you know, we've got some engineers who do due diligence in the company. They're really highly regarded engineers in our team. And we'd like to send one out to your house to come and visit you and kind of check you out. <laughs> that is and, hilarious. And, okay. And we so want, I, and, you know, and, and we want you to do a download of what all this technology is so that we get a better understanding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so a month later, this guy, super nice guy 
um, who was actually an ultrasound engineer, uh, he came out and spent a day at uh, here in Denver with me. I'm having a visual. And I'm having a visual of like the garage door opening and there's some guy like in a lab suit standing out front. <laughs> there's a what? There's some guy like in a lab suit or a, you know, like a white jacket or something like standing out front in your driveway and you're opening the garage door. That's my visual. Right, yeah, okay. no, yeah, it was <laughs> informal. I pick him up at the airport. We walk into my house. We go into my home office. Um, okay. And, um, and we sit down and we spend the day together. Yeah, cool. And anyway, that led to that led to them funding the development. Nice. So that was the one, you know, one of the sources of funding that I got along the way. That's a major breakthrough for you right there, right? I mean, that must have been a huge celebration moment for you. Like, wow, okay, somebody believes yeah. in me. I got I'm not bootstrapping. I got a partner in this. Okay, good for man. That's a huge moment right there for you. Yeah, okay. Massive. Yeah, massive. So yeah. they put a bunch of funding into it and we built prototypes and and they okay. did focus groups and the focus groups came out really well, but they were going through all these corporate transitions, you know, from Hewlett Packard to Agilent, Agilent then sells mm -hmm. to Phillips. Mm -hmm. And they decide at the time that we've done, we're done with all our studies, they decide that they don't want to go to market. Why? The idea, the idea was that I would license the technology to them. They would go to market, you know, and then I would move on and I would, you know, collect royalties or something. Okay. So they decide they don't want to go to market because they don't really, they, they want to focus on other areas. They want to focus on ultrasound and imaging and things like that. Well, yeah, but why and, not focus on the, the number one tool used by every doctor? I mean, I, okay. Well, I guess I don't know. They never gave me a reason, but I guess as a revenue generator, it's not a very okay. expensive item. So maybe, okay. you know, in terms of the size of the business. All right. So they choose, you know, they choose not to go forward. And the, and the agreement that we had was essentially they had a time window to decide whether they were interested or not. And if they weren't interested, they lost all rights to it. Okay. And I got, despite their, their investment, I own all the rights. Ooh, nice. Good job on the early paperwork on that deal. <laughs> yeah. I, I wrote the contract. Yeah, sweet. Despite the fact that it was a large company, I, I'd, I'd, I'd draw, <laughs> I did first draft. and I like it. You know, that was the term. So, you know, and there's a lesson in that as well is that just because you're working with a large company, it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you shouldn't do the drafting of the contract or at least the initial term sheet and you shouldn't be bullied. Great advice. Really good advice um, for the listeners. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, so I ensured that basically either you use it or you lose it completely. And mm -hmm. so I, we had all this information that it was a promising product. The fa you know, the focus groups look good. So at that point, I decided, okay, I'm just going to go to alone and I'm going to go to market. And, um, you know, and over the years, I've had a little bit of, you know, people who have partnered with me financially. Okay. Yeah. Um, but basically, the business for all intents and purposes has been bootstrapped all wow. the way through. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, okay, cool. And then can you, you might have to skip a, a tad, out, but can you do this for me, though, now? Because I want to hit you with a bunch of stuff here towards the back end, too. Can you give us the, the one? I'd like to know why you call it the one and then as it stands today the unit as it stands today give us a nice overview of the unit you know where it is now if you yeah. don't mind so so what we've got is we've got a small um essentially think of just the chest piece of a stethoscope for people who don't know what the device looks like um it's just the round chest piece that goes on the patient's chest so what what I did was I miniaturized it all down into one handheld device that fits in the palm of your hand that goes on the patient's chest. And then we connect it to earbud headphones or, you know, Bose headphones, Beats or anything like that. You can wear it with any kind of headphones. And it's just a small little device that uses external headphones. And that's what we reduced it down to. There's a and picture of it right one, behind you. Is that correct? Is that the, that's that's the latest it, that's, photo right behind that's you? That's it. And, yep. yeah. and to give some scale to that, that fits in the palm of your hand. Great. So, um, in fact, here it is. I've got one right here, actually. So, so that's the actual size of the device. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, so that, you know, shrunk it down into that. And that's what we sell today. And it's very small, very compact. Um, and the idea was to use earbud headphones or regular headphones. And that's been a big advantage during the whole COVID crisis. We can we can connect it to almost anything. We can connect it to, you know, wired headphones. We can put a Bluetooth transmitter into it. We can do wireless transmission. People can put the, the Bluetooth, you know, the, the stethoscope with a little transmitter inside a Ziploc bag and they can close it up for infection control or they can put it in a, in a, in a glove, you know, a medical glove and just listen through the glove. 
keep it clean. Um, so infection control has been people in, in that area who have had to deal with that have been really, you know, beating a path to our door to get as many of these as they can. Um, and then it connects up for telemedicine. So telemedicine has really exploded and we've been in that business for about five years. And the fact that it connects into a computer in a very easy way, it works with Zoom, it works with other video conferencing platforms. So a doctor can examine and listen to a patient remotely on telemedicine and a doctor can see all this and use headphones and do things that they you know, that they can't do with a regular stethoscope for infection control. So between infection control and telemedicine, um, yeah. things have just exploded in the last few months. I would, I would think so. In fact, when I was doing my research, I thought, well, I wonder if he's behind on orders. I wonder if he's able to keep up with demand. How is that lately? Like, are you, are you back? Are you, uh, you know, back ordered by months or how's it been lately? We got back ordered very, very fast. Mm -hmm. We I just, think. the demand just absolutely exploded. And wow, we, just I, got, yeah. we just got incredibly back ordered and there was just a, a storm of different things that occurred. We, you know, COVID took off, airports closed, demand skyrocketed. We've got global supply chains. We do our own assembly but we get parts from yeah. other countries. And now what's happening is that airlines aren't flying anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, DHL, FedEx and UPS are backed up like crazy. Mm -hmm. The airports in all these places, you know, in Shanghai and Hong Kong are just backed up where, you know, even if, you, if you're doing absolute express shipment because you need suddenly a huge amount of uh, inventory of parts and raw materials, they can't even get on a flight for a week. Yeah, wow. Because they yeah. just, the stuff is just backing up like crazy. Mm -hmm. So it was incredibly challenging. The logistics, the supply chain, the manufacturing capacity, we brought on more people to do manufacturing. And we pulled off manufacturing quantities that, that we wouldn't have dreamed were possible. Now we worked, <laughs> we worked 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. We had to protect our employees at the same time. So we, we right. sent everybody to work at home who could work at home, got very defensive about the procedures and protections we used in the company so that we mm -hmm. could, mm -hmm. nobody was going to get sick. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so it was wow. the stress, the stress level exploded along with the orders, the stress level exploded. I won't, yeah. you know, I can't, uh, you know, understate that. It was <laughs> yeah. extremely demanding. And then by skyrocketing our, our, production, we basically managed to keep up and, and, and get up to speed and get up to date. Wow. You know, I'm guessing like supply chain and operations management is not necessarily your favorite, but that's what you've been doing a lot of lately. Let, let me ask you a couple of questions. So, so telehealth was, is already like ramping up, right? Even before COVID telehealth is, you know, moving forward. And then somewhat. this is somewhat. Okay. And then this yeah. is now this is speeding it up for the listeners. Can you because I was really trying to just visualize all this in my head when I was preparing. So this, the stethoscope, it's, it's in the hands of the patient at home. The patient has that unit at home and they're holding it when they're on zoom with their doctor and the doctor saying, yeah, move it up, move it left, move it, yeah, move it here. And the doctor's listening through zoom while the patient moves it around. Is that accurate? That's basically it. A lot of the a lot of the uses where you might have a um, a home care nurse who goes in ah, with a kit. Okay. So the nurse will go in with a kit, with the stethoscope, with a computer, with other you know medical devices and things like that. <clears throat> go and visit the patient at home and do this. Um, or what it might be is that it might be a remote clinic where it's a remote clinic into a hospital. Um, so there are a lot of different locations where it's not necessarily only the patient in the home. Sometimes it's nursing homes. I see. Where you've got a lockdown nursing home, you've got I a do doctor who's remote. Um, there are even situations that we've encountered where, um, excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. Sorry. Um, let me just clear my throat. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah, I was really. <clears throat> I'm, I'm fascinated by I'm fascinated by the whole visual of that because I was thinking to myself, um, you know, 
I understood the Zoom. By the way, there's a there's a great uh, interview you did where I think it was with Zoom and maybe somebody else where you're you're going through exactly how that works with with Zoom yeah. and people people mm-hmm. can find that on YouTube. Great, great video. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was fascinated to learn all the different other areas. And now that yeah, you know, like nursing so nursing homes, I didn't even think about it. Is the is the is the nurse or the the CNA or whoever it is in the nursing home that's using it. Are they recording it and the doctor's listening later or it's live and the doctor's listening right then? They do both. There's a, there's a bias towards listening live. Okay. But they can, they are able to either record it on an app that we provide and they can then share the, you know, send the sounds. Okay. Or what they can do is they can do it live. As I say, the preference is towards live because that's more familiar in terms of doing direct, you know, real time exams. Mm. And, you know, the, you know, the use case, basically, the, the multiple use cases for telemedicine. So the one is, you know, as you described, it can be used in the home. It might be a healthcare worker or a nurse visiting a home. Yeah. It might be nurses or assistants in a, in a lockdown um, nursing facility or, you know, a long-term care facility of some kind where the doctor is remote. Um, in some cases in New York City, what they did was that they discharged patients who really weren't quite ready to be discharged they discharged them in order to empty out the hospitals for covid patients mm-hmm. during the you know the the explosion of covid that occurred in new york city and so telemedicine providers were actually going to patients homes because they really needed quite at a high level of monitoring and care because they would have been in the hospital had they not been uh, empty in the hospitals not being emptied out another use case um you know, so, so they're those kinds of situations where they're, mm-hmm. you know, they're visiting people's homes and they're doing that kind of thing. Um, and then another use case, which is kind of unexpected and unusual, was that there were physicians who had been quarantined. Ah, okay. So now what you've got is you've got a shortage of healthcare workers. Mm. You've got these very highly skilled physicians who are quarantined at home, nothing to do. They may not be very sick themselves, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And then what the hospital wants is that they want those doctors to still be available to examine patients. Mm-hmm. So now you've got yeah. the doctor in the home. It's the tables are turned. The doctors wow. in the home, patients are in the hospital and the doctors continuing to work. Interesting. Interesting. If the patient does have it at home, are they getting it from their doctor or is the doctor saying, Hey, I use these, you need to order one so that I can just do this from home. How, how, how does that, what's that conversation look like between doctor and patient? That model is evolving. Okay. Um, okay. That model is evolving. There's not a lot of, um, you know, use case of the patient at home using it yet. But I see that. Don't I, it's listen, thresholding. Can I just, it's can I, yeah, can it's, I, it's, yeah. it's about to happen. Or it's, was, it's, yeah. it's happen- it is happening. But what I'm saying is that we 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 ain't seen nothing yet on that whole model. Uh, right there is where I want to pause because when I was thinking about your business model. Right. I thought to myself, holy crap. I mean, if this explodes to where everybody has one of these, just like they have a thermometer at home, this is how, this is how it's going to go down. Right. This will, this will totally explode his business is what I was thinking. Am I reading that wrong? Am I? No, no, you're not. You're not. Yeah. It's abs- I, yeah you got it spot on. That is uh, where, that is where these things are going. These things are going into the home. Mm-hmm. Um, we make a, a very high grade professional product. Okay. So it is largely the professional market that's using these right now. But yeah. we've essentially said we know that we know that the home market will take off. Yes. We know that when and when the home market is ready, we will be ready. Okay. So the home the home market is now now that telemedicine is now a word in the English language instead right. of being a technical term. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we're we're going there. We're going okay. there. But okay. you know, we are essentially it's, it's one of those things of, you know, um, you know, go where the pack will be as opposed to where the pack is, but there's no point in standing around waiting for the pack to get there. Oh, so there's good. no, point, like in, there's no yep. point in going into the home when there's no home market. So, gotcha. you know, we've, we've sort of staged our release of products according to the, where the demand is. And we, you know, we're prepared and we're ready and good. we're headed there. Good for you. What's the business model there? Does in, are you thinking insurance will pay for it for the patients to get it, or it's just a they just buy it just like they buy a thermometer eventually, or the or the doctor pays for it and gives it to them? Do you know how that's going to go down? What do you predict? We we don't yet know what's going to happen because telemedicine reimbursement 
a lot of people may not be aware, but telemedicine reimbursement itself only really broke loose mm. the way that it is now with COVID. Okay. Um, okay. You know, until COVID, there was a very patchwork situation of reimbursement across different states mm. Mm. under different conditions with different caveats about what kind of patients mm. were eligible and what kind mm. of patients weren't. And it was a little bit of a maze and a bit of a difficult thing to navigate. And that was one of the things that was slowing down the adoption. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, then what happened was that COVID comes along and suddenly it's absolutely urgent and COVID essentially compressed time, right? Things that were happening, suddenly things that were going to happen over years were happening over weeks. And yep. telemedicine is one of those things. Reimbursement models is one of those things. And it's evolving. It's changing very rapidly. So we don't know exactly whether these are going to be prescribed devices by the doctor, paid for by the insurance company, given to the patient at the discharge. People will have them in their homes. All that stuff is evolving. When you make a sale right now, are you t do you target the hospital or the the doctor individually like how do you target that from a business development perspective how does that work who you yeah we we're talking to all of the above we talk okay. to so many different okay. groups there's so okay. many there's so many use cases all right you know we're actually astonished at how different how many different how creative people are and how the different use cases are even even within the question of infection control mm -hmm. there can be right. Right. Five different ways that hospitals want to wow. use. We want to use it wow. this way. Other people want to use it that way. So we're very much listening to the customer and listening to what the market wants and listening to people like that. And that's largely the way we operate. Uh, adoption. I was thinking about adoption of this product. I'm just going to guess there's, there's probably people that you tried to get to use it, like doctors or certain hospitals or whoever your target was. You're like, hey, man, you need this. And they're kind of fighting you on it because they're old school or whatever, you know, the doctors, you know, they use the same thing for years. And now all of a sudden they're calling saying, hey, we need those. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, doctors, <laughs> doctors are such creatures of habits. And I believe it. There's a good reason for it. There's a good reason for it. This is not a place to be creative yeah, good um, point good point and 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 go you know go into the weeds and do something that's not you know doctors <laughs> are driven by you know protocols and the right way to do things and so by nature they tend to be very very cautious mm. and that yep. caution tends to slow down innovation and adoption mm. the adoption mm. of new technology into healthcare people think healthcare is so advanced it's got so much adoption Healthcare adoption of technology is extremely slow. I mean, this is the only profession that needed the government to give doctors an incentive to use computers for, for their records. You know, <laughs> I, didn't know I mean, that. you know, accountants <laughs> didn't need a tax break yeah. to, to, <laughs> to, to computerize accounting or, you know, lawyers to computerize contracts and, and the medical profession, you know, in the, in the stimulus package, uh, yeah. you know, you know, in 2009, we're given an incentives to, to computerize their records. And that's right. kind of, you know, a case in point yeah. of, of just such conservatism in healthcare. I did have that visual of you when I was thinking about the podcast today, I, I was thinking, what, what is it like to pitch this thing to like a 69 year old doctor who's, you know, been doing his practice for 40 years. He's I bet, like, he's not, yeah. Well, but now they're listening. I got a couple of other questions here around uh, the, 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 uh, the model, the business model. I looked for competition, right? I looked, I did digital stethoscope, right? I looked it up and, okay, let me use it on Amazon. Where's it at? Who else is, who else is making these things? Where are you with, with that? Like, are you, do you have any idea like what percentage of the market you've penetrated? How big's the market and what other how are you going to stay ahead of the competition? Can you just talk a little bit about that, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's hard to say. Um, there aren't good metrics on the size of say the electronic stethoscope market versus okay. the regular stethoscope market and what percentage okay. that is of the total stethoscope universe. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of it, it, it there, there, there are a number of, you know, we've been in this for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there've been a number of startups in recent years and some of them have survived and some of them haven't. Okay. Um, and, you know, we don't pay a lot of attention to our competition and we pay attention to our customers and what they're okay. looking for. Okay. And that's kind of our focus. We, we listen to our customers. 
And so I don't really know, you know, the extent to which competitors have penetrated the market. Um, okay. And, you know, there's a, there's a confirmation bias that the people who love our product and want our product are the people who are talking to us, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't know people who might be talking to other companies or buying other companies' products. They may, you know, we may, they may, they may not be visible to us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you know, we just know that we're, you know, we're flooded with business. And yeah. that's, that's what we worry about is how to satisfy the customer. If you do the right product, you know, things will take care of themselves. Do the patents protect you with uh, the sound quality and, and so forth to where nobody can touch you with that anyway? Uh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm assuming they do. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, patents afford you protection and trade secrets afford you protection as well. Mm. So there's a combination of patents and, mm. and trade secrets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if people took these things apart and try to reverse engineer them, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of manufacturing yeah. um, tricks of the trade that we that we implement mm. that protect us and gotcha. you know um, you know patents your obligation in a patent is actually to teach everything you know it's part yeah. of the deal it's part of the deal of the patent of Good patent point. law which is you can get a monopoly on something as long as you share your knowledge with the world so that they can benefit in twenty years time. So that's the double-edged sword of patents. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't patent certain things, then you can keep them as trade secrets. And of course, you can't do something in a patent and keep it as a trade secret at the same time. You've got to make mm -hmm. a choice because you have this so-called obligation to teach when you mm -hmm. disclose things in a patent. So there are things that are not patented that are trade secrets. More good advice for the aspiring entrepreneurs out there developing something. Let me ask about uh, telehealth in general for a second. I'm fascinated by this topic and how your company could benefit from it. I mean, will will there come a day where, you know, you, you give your urine sample, your blood sample, your temperature, the you know, they listen to your heart. Like, will there be a day where all that just happens from home? Probably. Absolutely. And a scan, probably a scan of some kind where some camera like – it has the ability to scan your body and look for, I don't know. Is that, what do you think? Is that too Star Trek? I don't know. <laughs> I think the scan might be a stretch, but the okay. rest of it is not a stretch at all. The rest of it is just an extrapolation of what already exists. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely going to happen. Um, and it is happening already. Good. And the technology is there. And it's a matter of uh, people just becoming used to it and comfortable with it. But absolutely, people are going to be making a lot of things at home. A lot of things that go in, in the doctor on the in the doctor's office are going to go to the home things in the hospital are going to go to the home mm -hmm. they are many of them are already in the home they just not it's just not the standard at the moment the standard mm -hmm. is still in the, in the doctor's office COVID, as i said earlier is just accelerating things really really rapidly it'll go there and you're eventually going to have of course artificial intelligence which is going to basically do the frontline screening it's going to look at your weight, your pulse oximetry, your stethoscope sounds, your EKG, um, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of other things, your blood pressure, a few other things. And it's going to essentially draw a picture along with a few questions. And it's going to be able to screen things out. And what that's going to do is that's going to free up the doctor mm. to deal with the stuff that really needs the doctor's time. Mm. Are you going to move towards other products do you want to just are you what's your plan there because i thought about that too as a as a you know a business guy i was i was a long-term business executive before i was a recruiter for rider flex and so I, I thought okay well this is really cool what's he making after this <laughs> are, are there yeah. any plans for other units other devices yeah you know i mean i've got i've got pages and pages and pages of ideas <laughs> uh some of them are medical and some of them aren't um okay the so ideas are easy and ideas are there's more ideas than you can you know fit into one lifetime um the stethoscope what has happened is the initial idea was oh we'll do a stethoscope and then we'll do another thing and another thing and what happens is as time goes on people have essentially come to us for more and more specialized questions and mm. you know there are things we do for companies you know that are not publicized where we're actually working on technology and things like that. So we've become more and more and more sort of world specialists in this particular field. Okay. okay. So 
so we've become deeper into something instead of becoming horizontal we've gone vertical as sort of like the world experts in in electronic stethoscopes and electronic stethoscope acoustics okay i was wondering about you know whether or not you were thinking of of other things okay very good how many employees today can you share that how big is the company with employee size yeah we've got like eight or nine people okay yeah i mean we we run really really lean and efficient Mm. Um, and I think it's part of the bootstrapping story. Mm-hmm. I noticed there's a young man with the last name of Smith in the sell, on the sales team. Wouldn't happen to be related. <laughs> he would happen to be related. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him on, I saw him on LinkedIn. I said, mm, I bet that's his boy. I was pretty right, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's okay. one of my sons. Yeah. He's, he's, he's involved in the business. No pressure or anything for him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a tricky it's a tricky thing. It's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic to, you know, work with family and, you know, you can really share in the journey and that's a wonderful aspect. And, you know, I think it's probably difficult for the younger generation. Mm-hmm. I would bet so. So now that you've had this journey, by the way, before I ask you a couple of entrepreneurial advice things here, as we head towards wrap up, I'm curious, this COVID situation has, has really just kind of catapulted. I don't know if that's the right word your business lately. So I'm just guessing you're having these, 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 this, this odd emotional reaction, like, okay, this is like, I feel terrible about what's happening on the planet, but, but man, this is good for the business too. Um, like it's, it's, there's this weird silver lining happening for you. Is that, is that, is that an odd emotional feeling a little bit? It is extremely difficult. Um, it is extremely yeah. difficult. I would think so. People said to me early on, you know, we, we, had, <clears throat> we had to deal with our own health. We had to deal with the, our employees' health, our whole team's health, and make sure mm-hmm. everybody was, was healthy. And if we were going to stay open, I mean, we had a, I had the question, should we stay open or shouldn't we? Mm-hmm. Maybe we just, you know, we, we could see what was going on in, in Italy and New York. And we were just mm-hmm. thinking, you know, this, just, this wave of destruction is just going to hit us here in Colorado. Mm-hmm. maybe we should just be shutting down. And you know what? Life is more important than money. It's not even a contest. Mm-hmm. Uh, should we just shut down? And it's just like, look, this is too bad. W- one of the things that made it, that kept us going, it was not an easy decision. I'll be honest mm-hmm. with you. We really mm-hmm. thought, should we, for, the, for safety, should mm-hmm. we just shut down? <clears throat> and yeah. what kept us going was that the emails and the orders that started coming in, it wasn't about... At all. It wasn't about like, whoa, this is fantastic. We're getting all these orders. There was an incredible emotional pressure from the point of view that the orders were coming with emails of desperation Mm -hmm. from doctors on the front line saying, I've just placed an order. When can you ship this? I'm on duty in 48 hours in a COVID ward. Hospitals calling us and saying, we have to protect, protect our healthcare workers. We don't have PPE. We need your stethoscope in order that Mm -hmm. Only one person is near the patient and the doctor can be yep. 15 feet away, 25 feet away, remote or whatever it is. The, it, was, it was there. We, we went from um, providing something that was a benefit to saving patients' lives to something that was saving doctors' and nurses' mm-hmm. lives. And so what yep. we actually felt was we have a duty to stay open. Yeah. Yep. And people and- said to me, you know, sorry, you know, apropos of the, your question, you know, did we have mixed feelings? We felt like it was our duty to stay open. And when people said to me, oh, you're really busy. That's fantastic. It must be so exciting. And I said, no, Mm -hmm. this is not exciting. This is really, really high pressure. Mm -hmm. It's our duty to do what we're doing. We feel that we are helping a cause here. Yep. But I would never say that there was anything fun, exciting, or you know, anything like that. None yeah, of those about, words yep. apply. Yep. But, but uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about you when, when I was preparing. And I also thought you might be having the feeling like, wow, you know, after, after I was trying to build a company and I, I did want to make this thing. And, but now it's, you got to be having a little bit of this feeling like you're, you know, not to get too philosophical or religious or anything else, but you got to kind of be having this feeling like, okay, this might be why I was put here. Like maybe maybe I was, this is my purpose. Maybe my purpose was to, was to be here for this time period to be able to make this device to help people 
right now during this during this pandemic, right? I mean, it yeah. could be. Maybe it was all meant to be. I don't, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I don't take a, some kind of you know, fatalistic religious yeah. view on things. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that would kind of be a little bit too self centered in a way um, okay. to 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 see things that way. Um, but it's more about we've got something that not that it was meant to be, but we've got something that can make a big difference and it's our mm -hmm. duty to make mm -hmm. a big difference mm -hmm. given the circumstances. So I don't want to ascribe some grand plan to any of it, but it's, but we do have a, a mission to really help out. If you can help, you must help. Yeah, I totally agree. It's fantastic that you have this device right now available for people. Um, really awesome stuff. Let me ask you headed towards uh, almost out of time here. If you had to give, I mean, you've been through so much over the last 20 plus years. You've lived it all, man. Everything from working on it in your garage to bootstrapping to, to getting the product to market, getting it built, now having it ready and, and then dealing with everything during COVID. I mean, you could write a book on, you know, being an entrepreneur. Is there anything that you want to tell the aspiring entrepreneur that hasn't started yet, but has a really good idea? They just need to take the leap. Anything you want to tell them? Well, I think people should, um, you know, th th there's so much I could say. I could answer this on any, yeah. on, ev on any given day. I could give you 10 different answers. <laughs> so I don't think there's one distilled uh, nugget necessarily that I have. But I mean, I would say, first of all, if you want to start a business, you should really try and do it. Uh, don't live with regret. Um, get on with it. Be very realistic. Be realistic about how long things take. They're going to take a lot longer than you expect. Um, have a plan for how you're going to survive the long haul. Um, don't think that the only way to do things is that you've got to go out and raise venture capital or get investors or anything like that. Um, figure out if there's a way that you can bootstrap. There's, a, there's an approach that's taken in all introductory engineering courses, which is where you're given very restrictive constraints and you've got to solve a problem. Instead of saying, solve a problem and you can use whatever resources you want, the, the question is always like, you know, given spaghetti and glue, build a bridge, you know? <laughs> and and it's, right. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole mm -hmm. thought process. And it, it's one of the most valuable things in engineering thinking is given the constraints I've got. So I think that in many ways, what, what I think entrepreneurs who are starting out should do and think about is given the constraints that I've got, what, what can I actually achieve? What's realistic? What isn't realistic? What can I do? Instead of saying, gee, if only I could raise you know, a series A, a seed round or whatever it is, gee, we could do this. And, and I mean, that applies to some businesses, but not every business has got the potential growth trajectory that you need for a venture capital payout. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of really, really good businesses that aren't going to grow at 40% a year or right. return, yep. you know, and they're incredibly good businesses and they're still worth doing and they're going to produce products that are still worth doing. So rather think about, okay, given my situation, given what I want to do, how can I do it? Given all the constraints, how do I make this happen? And then you suddenly find out, well, I could outsource certain things. I could only go after this particular product and not those particular products. Actually, the problem that I can solve is I've got a product that solves five problems, but actually one of them is the most interesting problem. And it's actually not that expensive. Let me solve that problem. Mm. So there's so many ways where you, you know, don't go in with one idea, figure out you need $10 million and then write a business plan and go and start and say that the problem I've got is fundraising. That isn't necessarily the problem. The problem is you've got to find a market for something. You've got to solve a problem. You've got to work out, define the problem according to your constraints and then get out there and do it. Very nice. Very good. If you, um, if you could call your 21 year old self, but how old were you when you got on the plane to come over for, for, for grad school? How old um, I, was, I was 24 years old. Okay. If you could call that 24-year-old and tell him anything today, if you could go back in time and call him, what would you say? What would you tell him? Um, wow, that is a great question. Um, you know, I would probably say don't procrastinate so much. Okay. Time, you know, time is, time is short. Um, 
you know, I don't think I was lacking in courage or gumption or obnoxiousness or whatever, however you might want to define, um, you know, the, the intestinal fortitude to kind of get out there and talk to anybody you want to talk to. But you can almost reach anybody in the world that you really want to talk to. If you want to ask someone a question, I mean, I've written emails at 11 o'clock at night uh, to Nobel Prize winners to ask them questions, and I got, a, I got an email back in 15 minutes. It's amazing if you just you know, want to just get out there and contact people and talk to people, you can do it. And I, I, you know, I never lacked for that, but there is a procrastination that goes on. It's like trying to decide, is this the best way or is that the best way? And the, you know, the single worst le uh, thing that I ever heard when I was working in a big corporation was do it right the first time. That whole culture doesn't exist anymore. Like now it's all about rapid prototyping, fail fast. And in the early part of my career, all I was hearing was I was hearing this thing from the big corporation, which is do it right the first time. And it's just nonsense. There's no way to do it right the first time. Just get <laughs> right. out there. So the, the, the advice that exists today is the advice that I really could have used way back when, which is just get out there, do it, make mistakes quickly. Mm -hmm. Very good. People know that now. Very, very good, Clive. By the way, for the listeners, thinklabs.com, thinklabs.com. Is that where they should go if they're interested in ordering uh, any other direction for them there? Yeah, thinklabs.com is where they can start. Okay. And okay. uh, store.thinklabs.com is where they should finish. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the website's got a lot of great information on it. Um, you also have a YouTube uh, channel with several great videos on them as well, right? Yeah, we do. We get a lot of visitors to our YouTube channel and it's got, um, it's got information about our product and it's also got sounds, heart and lung sounds for, for medical education and for doctors and nurses and medical and nursing students to listen to different kinds of pathological sounds. So we put that out there as a free service to people. Congratulations on everything you've built, my friend. I mean, really, lots of years of fortitude. Uh, I could use a bunch of other words, but you've really just been uh, I mean, so consistent and, and tough as you've built the brand over these years. And here you are. I mean, congratulations. Really, yeah, really, yeah. really, thank, really good stuff. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And uh, it never hurts in this business to be a workaholic. <laughs> right. You got that right, my friend. The Rider Flex podcast features entrepreneurs, business executives, and the stories behind how they got there as well as daily tips on career advice and job interviews. Our show can be heard just about anywhere these days, but you can visit riderflex.com and click on the podcast page to hear all the previous episodes and learn more about the recruiting and consulting services we provide. Contact us at the email address info at riderflex.com or 888-964-5876. Thanks so much for listening. And if you enjoy our show, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and like the episodes.